right. So it is time. Um, any questions? Any questions about subroutines? Yep, go ahead. It's about what? The second exam. The second exam? Well, it'll be, it'll be one week after the practice exam, which is going to be soon because we are running out of time. So it'll be soon, pretty, you know, like next class meeting, Wednesday. It'll be our practice exam? Yep. So one week after the practice, like next Wednesday, will be the actual exam too. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it will be focused mostly on subroutines, recursion, parameters, local variables, and that sort of thing. So that's because that's basically what we... Um, trace with the arrays? Um, trace with arrays and also with the recursion. Okay. So it will be basically all trace-based and there will be no uh, proof whatsoever. Um, so some people don't like the proof, you know, some people do. <clears throat> but this one will be more tedious because of all the <coughs> tracking, all the tracing. Yes, yes. Yep. So the, there is a new homework assignment. So before we talk about any other things, you know, probably we'll be revisiting uh, subroutines today just to make sure that those ideas or those concepts are synced in. So we'll take a look at recursion first. Uh, recursion 2, which is uh, your next homework assignment. It is due on the 18th, which is next Monday, because you know before the practice exam or before the actual exam on Wednesday, I want to make sure that you guys actually get some hands-on practice and give you the solution prior to that. And before we get started with the discussion of this new homework assignment, I want to emphasize that homework assignments are supposed to be individual work. So that means if I see um, evidence that a particular homework or the submission is copied from somebody else, I will give both people zeros, okay? And if I see a pattern of that stuff going on, I will also inform the dean. So this is one thing that you know, people really should be aware of, is I really try to you know, make sure that people do not copy homework assignments, okay? And sometimes I can tell pretty easily. All right, so getting back to this one. So the start uh, document is here with recursion two. I don't have the microphone today because you know, apparently all the batteries are dead. I have eight dead batteries here. Um, and I was told that the people at the lab, they're looking into buying rechargeables and they will have a recharge, you know, uh, a charge station in the classroom. So this way, you know, it, it just makes a lot more sense. They just have to buy two sets of batteries, like four, and we'll have, you know, battery always, you know. <clears throat> But you know, until that happens, you know, we are currently out of the, uh, the loudspeaker, the microphone. All right, so this is your new homework assignment. I'm going to save the document first, and then we'll take a quick look at it. I don't think you guys will find it to be really kind of challenging, okay? It might, you might find it to be a little bit boring because we have encountered you know, this kind of code before. So that's the entire code. You know, we have a subroutine called XYZ. It is recursive, okay, you know, because when you look at line four, line four has a single return statement that has the right hand side of the return involves the invocation of the very same subroutine that we are currently in. But when you look at the structure of this code, I think you should find it to resemble you know some of the code that we have seen already. Okay, I'm not gonna name which one, nor which thing we talked about it, because I have a lot of that. No, really, I forgot about what day we talked about it. But if you go back to the recording from past week, I'm pretty sure you can find it. So that's your homework assignment. Um, I really don't think this should be really challenging for the most part, except you, know, you have to type a bit, you know, just to make sure that you get all the details right. So I'm not gonna spend much time to talk about it unless you guys have specific questions about it. Any specific questions? No? Okay. All right. So I would just leave it up here, you know, just in case somebody has question about it. But we'll go through some kind of trickier um, subroutine invocations here, okay, you know, in this class. <clears throat> because there are certain assumptions or certain things that we haven't really talked about or certain combinations that we haven't seen before. So what I'll do is I'm going to use a new spreadsheet to talk about it. So new spreadsheet. 
and we'll start with an interesting combination of stuff. Okay, so this one does use a single global variable. It has one subroutine or two subroutine definitions, uh, but the tricky part is it has invocations that matters whether which you know, which invocation happens first. Okay, so we'll take a look at this one and let's go ahead and define the subroutine. The the first subroutine is just going to be called X Y Z. Doesn't do a whole lot. Okay, <clears throat> it doesn't even take a parameter, no parameters whatsoever. What it does do is it, you, it makes use of a global variable. Let's just call it global variable x here. So it changes the global variable using this kind of odd, kind of odd way of doing the calculation. So it's going to say you know x times um, a particular prime number. Let's pick 17 as a prime number, um, and We'll say mod another prime number. I think, yeah. So we'll we'll do a mod uh, another prime number. Say 19. Okay, it doesn't have to be the same number. Okay. And it has a return value. All it's going to return is to return x here. And define sub just like that. All right. So the next line we're gonna have you know something like this. Define sub, and this is going to be our main subroutine. And in this particular main subroutine, we'll have our local variable, which is called. Eh, let's see. Let's call it x two. Okay, should not be a problem. And in this case, it oh there is a problem because the global x is going to be hidden if I have a local x, so I cannot initialize the global x if I do it like this. So we'll have a local variable y. The global variable x is going to be initialized to a particular value. I'll pick another prime number, which is 7. And then the local variable y is going to be the result of the invocation of xyz as a subroutine. And I have to do it in a way that is not symmetric. Okay, So subtraction is not symmetric. So we can do something like this, invoke xyz minus invoke XYZ like that okay and define sub this is the end of the main subroutine so if I do the indentations here then we'll end up with something like that and then we say invoke main that's the only line outside of the definition of, definition of any subroutine and this is the program that I am going to trace and the idea is on line 8 the ordering of the invo of evaluating the invocation does matter. Okay? If it's left to right versus right to left, it will give us different results. Okay? Are there any questions about this particular program just by looking at the code before we start to trace it? No questions? All right, let me just double check and make sure that the recorder is on because I don't want you guys to kind of focus more on what I talk about instead of just busy copying everything from the whiteboard. I also found a really kind of interesting tool which I'm going to try to utilize today. Let me close all the screens that do not really are not useful. So we'll close that one. Okay. I'm just closing all the distraction here. This one is kind of a distraction. That's definitely not needed. And that one is not needed. Okay. So I got this kind of interesting tool. Let me see if it's going to be useful <coughs> in today's class. It's called Audacia. And the program allows me to paint on the screen. So if I switch back to the browser, um, oh, this is not the browser, this is the other one. And let me pick a color here. Nope, doesn't work. Oh. Okay, it's not working. <laughs> It was working when I tested this, you know, in the other classroom, but for some reason it's not working now. So 
always like that. Alright, so I'm not gonna spend too much time to play with this one. The idea is that you know, I would be able to draw on the screen to annotate stuff on the screen you know, as we go over the trace. But since it's not working, it's okay. It's not a big deal. <clears throat> Alright, so let's go ahead and trace this code and find out what it is going to do. And there will be two traces to exactly the same program. Because the first trace is going to evaluate the invoke on line 8 from left to right. And then the second trace is going to trace it from right to left. And then we'll see how those two traces are almost exactly the same, but the result is going to be different. A different value will end up in y. Yep. Which direction is the correct direction? There's no such thing as the correct direction. In other words, when you have multiple invocations on the same line in the same expression, that it's up to the C compiler to decide how it wants to do it. Unless, okay, there's a big unless here. The only unless is when you have a logical and or logical or involved. In that case, as far as the logical operator is concerned, it is always from left to right. But for subtraction, there's no or no specific order. In other words, the ANSI standard does not specify which is the right order. Go ahead. So we're not talking about like instancing where since both of them are both on the same line, the global variable would stay the same for both subroutines. It cannot because it's a global variable. The first invocation will end up changing it. Yeah, so the second time you invoke <coughs> is going to be different. Yeah. So I'm thinking if you're threading, and so both invocations are going through simultaneously. Right. They're not. They cannot go on simultaneously. So it has to it has to be in a sequence. Okay. Now in this case, you know, there is a particular value of x that after that point it will all be the same. If x is zero, then it doesn't matter what we do; it's going to be zero. But you know, given this particular example, that is not happening. Okay. All right. So we'll go through the tracing. You know, this time, going from left to right. Okay. Um, we will need. We won't need a comment because there's nothing to comment on. There are no conditions to evaluate, so we can start up with a line number. And in this case, we do have a global variable. X is a global variable because in the subroutine X Y Z, X is not a parameter. It is not a local variable, so it must be a global variable. Same arguments apply to main. It is not a local variable. It is not a parameter. So x, is, x has to be a global variable. So that's why it, it starts with a column already with an unknown value to begin with. And this is our precondition. Then we start execution on the line that is outside of the definition of any subroutine, which is on line 10. Line 10 is just invoking main. We need a return line number and also the allocation of local variable y. Local variable y starts with an unknown value. The return line number is post because there are no, there's no additional line of code to execute after line 10. So, so far, nothing really too mysterious. On line 7, which is the first line that actually does anything useful in main, we are just initializing the global variable x to also 7, which is coincidental. So the line number and the value you know, just so happen to be 7 in both cases. And then line 8 is the big question. Okay, because on line 8, it has two invocations of x, y, z. But we can only handle one invoke at a time. Because remember what we talked about last time? In the return info cell, if you end up with two question marks, there's something wrong. Okay, you can only have one and only one question mark when you have a return info cell. So that means in this case, on line 8, when we execute line 8, we cannot do the subtraction, let alone doing the assignment, because we don't know the values of the invocation of x, y, z. But you can only invoke one at a time, which means when you specify the return info or return information of this line on line 8, we are going back to line 8. We know that for sure. We still have to complete the assignment operation. We know that for sure as well. What we can choose uh, you know what? What is an option here? Is are we evaluating the invoke x y z on the left hand side of the subtraction first, or are we dealing with the one on the right hand side first? That is a choice, and you don't know the ordering that your compiler will choose for you. Okay, so this is kind of like a mystery. You can test it out, but you don't know for sure. But as I said earlier, 
this time we're going to use the left to right order. Yep. I just had one question about the C compiler. Mm -hmm. If the C compiler decides to run that statement one way as opposed to the other, would the program look the same or behave the same? It will not behave the same, but it will still look the same. So that's why you know you have to be careful when you're dealing with programs or well, subroutines like this, where it has put code what we call a side effect. Okay? In other words, in addition to returning a value, it is changing something that will affect its own return value the next time you call it. So we'll take a look at this particular sequence where we handle <coughs> where we evaluate the invokes from left to right. So that means we're only dealing with the one on the left-hand side. The right-hand side one is still unhandled yet. So we, we'll deal with it when we get back to line eight after this first invocation of XYZ. So that's why the return info looks like this, is because we are only handling the left invocation. Every time you invoke the subroutine, you have to look into the subroutine here, XYZ, does it have local variables? No. Does it have any parameters? No. So we are not going to use up any additional columns other than E to remember where we're going back to and what else we have to do when we get back onto line 8. So now that we have set up the return info, we continue execution in the subroutine, which is starting on line 2. So if you ask me what is, what is 7 times 17 mod 19, I can honestly tell you that I don't know. So I'll let the computer figure it out. Okay, so we just you know, put an equal here so that we can use um, the spreadsheet to actually do the calculation. The last operation is a mod, and the dividend of the mod is x times 17. x has a value of 7 at this point, times 17, that's the result of the dividend. Then we specify the divisor, which is 19. Oops, close paren, press the enter key. And now we have the answer five. Okay, so that's 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 not too that's not too bad. Then on line three we have the return statement. The return statement is only returning the value of the global variable x, which currently has a value of five. So returning five is no big deal. Okay, all we have to do is to locate locate the return info cell, copy and paste it, and then change the question mark to whatever the return value is, which in the, in this case is five. So I will do exactly what I said, copy, paste, change the question mark to the value that we're returning, and we're done. Do we have any questions about this particular step on line three? We are specifying a return value, okay? And then on line four, which is the end of the subroutine, we got two things to do. First one is to locate what is the return info cell, and just like before, I copy and paste the entire line just so that we know not only which line we're going back to, but also when we get back onto line eight, what does it look like now, what is left to do on line eight. The second thing we have to do is to say column E is no longer useful because we have just utilized the value of that line. So we copy and paste the return info cell, right click, and then we choose um, strike through as an option. And then we have now indicated that column E is now deallocated. So if I resize column A a little bit, we are now back to line eight. But when we get back to line eight, it is not quite the same as line eight in the original code because the left invocation is now done. It has resolved to a particular value of five. So at this point on row 11 of the trace, we are back to line eight, but we only have the right-hand side invoke to deal with now. Okay, the invoke on the right-hand side of the subtraction that's the only thing left to do before I can do the actual subtraction and then the assignment. So this is another invocation of XYZ, which means we have to reallocate column E because it is, after all, the leftmost available column at this point. And then we have to remember, okay, how, where are we going back to? Once again, we're going back to line 8. When we get back to line 8 this time, Y gets a value of 5 minus the result of the invocation of the second invocation of the right hand side. Let me just uh, move things around a little bit. Are there any questions about how we set up the return info for the right hand side invocation? Any questions? 
Questions? Okay. All right. So now that we have set up the return info cell, we can continue execution in the subroutine. And the subroutine starts with line two. Line two, once again, wants to do some calculations. And once again, I am going to use the spreadsheet to do all the calculation. It is the mod of the current value of x, which is five at this point, times 17, and then the dividend or the divisor is 19, like that. And the end result is nine, okay? Once again, this is not really the important part. On line three, we, we return the value of x, which is a global variable. And when you return a value, you just copy and paste the return info cell, change the question mark, which is a placeholder of the return value, and change it to the value that we are actually returning, and we are all done. Then we move on to line four. Line four is the end of the subroutine. We clean up stuff, and then we have to continue execution. So we look up the rightmost return info cell which says, you know, okay, let's go back to line eight. And this is what line eight looks like at this point. And then the second thing we do on line four is to deallocate column E because we are at the end of an invocation. So we copy and paste the struck out version of return info and to indicate column E is now gone. Then we get back to line eight. But this time when we get back to line eight on row 16 of the trace, line eight is ready to evaluate the subtraction because we already know the values to the left and to the right hand side of the subtraction. Five minus nine is negative four. So when we know the right hand side of the assignment operation, <coughs> we just copy that to the left hand side. So variable y, which is a local variable, now ends up with a value of negative four. And if you look up column D, that is the column that y is located. So column D gets a value of negative four that concludes the actual execution of line eight. Then we move on to line nine and the rest of the program is not particularly exciting because on line nine, which is the end of this main subroutine, we only have to do two things. One is to look up the return uh, line number, which is post in this case, make a note of that. The second thing is to deallocate column C and D, the return info, uh, excuse me, the return line number and also the local variable Y are both on a per invocation basis. So at the end of an invocation, we just say, we don't need these two anymore. Make sure they look uh, struck out. Okay, whoops, wrong place to right click. Here we go, strike through. And then once we continue execution, at, once we continue execution at post, that indicates the end of the entire trace. We are all done. Do we have any questions about this example? Did I introduce or secretly slip in something that is new to us? Yep. Well, I have a question. If yep. the compiler goes left to right, does it always go left to right? Nope. It's it's up to the compiler. So it's <laughs> like a random choice? It is usually not random. There's a particular reason why it wants to go in one direction or the next or the other, but you have no idea which one it's supposed to use. So that's why unless you have a logical operation, like a logical and or a logical or, where it is guaranteed to go from left to right because we need to use the short circuited evaluation. Otherwise, if, if you're dealing with a subtraction, you don't know which way is gonna, which one is evaluated first. The, our assumption or our intuition, mostly we just say, okay, we'll do the same way as when we <coughs> read it, which is from left to right, but that is usually not guaranteed. So you have to be extra careful with these things. Okay. So are there any questions about this particular trace where uh, the evaluation is from left to right? If it is going from right to left, what do you think is going to be the result? Four, it's yep, it's going to be positive four because it's going to be nine minus five. Okay. So maybe I'll leave it up to you guys to do the alternative, but the alternative of evaluating the right-hand side first and then the left-hand side will end up with a five on the right-hand side and a nine on the left-hand side. Nine minus five is positive four, and that's the, but they are different, okay? The main point is they are gonna be different. Okay. Any other questions regarding this particular example? 
questions? All right. So this is a really good example of showing you why global variables are tricky to use. Because the, the reason why the ordering of the call does matter is because of the global variable x that is used on line two inside xyz. Because every time you change xyz, it will affect what value is going to return. And as a result, the order of calling xyz becomes important. All right, if, there's, if there are no questions about this, we have never seen a case where we have double recursion in the same subroutine. In other words, in the very same subroutine, there are two uh, calls to itself. Okay, we haven't seen anything like that yet. So we'll first get used to the concept of that particular idea of having two recursive calls in one subroutine, and then we'll talk about the actual trace of, okay, what happens when we have something like that? The, the most famous example of something like that is called the Fibonacci number. Fibonacci number. I'm pretty sure that's a typo, but it will find the number anyway. Fibonacci. Oh, okay. I actually got it right. Okay. When you, if you look at Wikipedia, it shows you the actual equation. You know, these, this is the sequence of numbers, but the actual definition looks like this. Okay. Um, you basically have a few ways to look at it, you know, the so-called seed values. f of 1 is 1 by definition, f of 2 is 1 by definition. Alternatively, you can move down the numbers and say by definition f of 0 is 0, f of 1 is 1. They are equivalent, okay? It's just a matter of do we stop when the number that we are dealing with is 2, or do we stop when the number that we are dealing with is 1? That's the only difference. But the recursive definition of the recursion, the recurrence relation, which is highlighted up here, is f of n is f of n minus one plus f of n minus two. Okay? Does this look to you that we can use recursion to deal with this calculation? Yeah, it looks that way, even though it doesn't look like a lot of invocation of subroutines. We can do it, okay? So we'll go ahead and just look at this code and say, okay, can how do we turn this definition into the definition of a subroutine? It's actually not too bad, not too bad. And I am going to use the same spreadsheet to deal with this one. So here's the pseudo code. So we'll say define subroutine XYZ. And this time we do have a parameter, which is n. So we say by val n. We don't need by reference because we are not changing the parameter itself. We are making use of the return value to report back the actual result of the calculation. So n is, for the most part, an input variable, which means it doesn't need to be passed by reference. You only need to pass it by reference when you intend to change the parameter, to the parameter itself and use that as a mechanism to pass information back to the caller. But in this case, we have a return value, so it's not an issue. So we'll use a, a multi-branch conditional statement here. And we'll use the definition when n is 1. Then the return value is going to be 1. Else if n equals to 2, then I think the return value is 2. Let me just double check and make sure. Uh, nope, I got it wrong. In both cases, it is a return value of 1. So we'll just change this one to 1, 2. No big deal. Else. Aha! Else what do we do? We return invoke XYZ. And then the first one, doesn't matter which one, because this time we do, do not use any global variables. So now we can say the first one is just you know, n minus 1 specifying the new parameter n. Plus another invoke, this time we use n minus 2 to specify the new parameter n. And if this ends the multi-branch conditional statement, and then end define sub to actually end the definition of the subroutine. And then we go back and fix all the indentations. One, two, three, indent. So, okay. Now we can define the relatively useless main subroutine just basically as an entry point of the entire program. And let's put a local variable x here. And then we say x is invoke 
x, y, z. Um, let's see, 2 is too easy. 3 is a little more fun, so we'll start with the 3. And define sub, invoke main, and that's the program that we are going to trace. So give each one line numbers. There you go. Okay. All right. So now we have our pseudocode, and then we have to perform the trace over here. There we go. All right. This time we do need comments because we have a conditional statement to evaluate. So comments is here. Line number is here. The precondition has nothing to say because we actually do not have any global variables in this particular program. Because when you look at the use of the names, n is a five value parameter inside the definition of x, y, z. And then x is a local variable inside the definition of main. So that means we don't really have any name that is not a local variable or a parameter. So everything is not a global variable. We start execution on the first line that is outside the definition of a subroutine. In this case, it's line 15. So we start with line 15 which needs a return line number, which is going to be post because you know that's line 15 is the last line of the program already. And then we need one column for x, which starts with an unknown value because it is a local variable. Okay, That's pretty easy. That's the really easy part. Now we get into the subroutine main. And the only line in main that actually does anything useful is line 13. Line 13 is easy this time. Okay, because it only has one single invoke on the right hand side of the assignment statement, which means we need a return info cell because it does have a value to return. So we say return info. When this invocation is done, we are going back to line 13. But by the time we get back to line 13, we already have the value on the right hand side to assign to the right to the left hand side. So that's why I put a question mark here. That is representing the invocation that I'm dealing with in this particular case. Any invocation of x, y, z requires an additional column because we have a parameter n. On line 13, it is pretty clear that we want n as a parameter to start with the value of 3. So that's how we set up the, column e's, the columns e and f for the first invocation of x, y, z, which is trying to figure out the Fibonacci number of 3. Do we have any questions at this point? Okay. Nothing up to this point is actually new or interesting. So when we get into the subroutine, this is a little bit longer, so we need kind of some constant scrolling around here. So when we get to subroutine XYZ, we always start execution from the beginning, which is on line 3. So on line 3, it says, OK, is does n equal to 1? n equals 1 is false because n has a value of 3. Because it's a multi-branch conditional statement, we now check for the second condition, which is on line 5. Line 5 asks, is n, does n equal to 2? And then you answer the question and say n equals 2 is also false, which means we have to get to the else case. So that means we have no choice but to execute line 8. Line 8 is recursive. And it looks a little bit like the one that we saw earlier. It has two invocations. In this case, what do you think? Does it matter whether we do with the right hand side first or the left hand side first? Does it matter? In other words, you have to think about what made a difference in the previous case where evaluating the right hand side versus the left hand side first makes a difference. There are two reasons why it made a difference in the previous program. Yeah, go ahead. Well, one was subtraction. Uh huh. Subtraction is one because subtraction is not commutative, whereas addition is. So that means you know the moment we see the addition, we have just lost one big reason for the ordering to be important. What was the second reason? I was using a global variable in the previous program. This one has no global variables. So every time you call a subroutine with exactly the same parameter, it always comes back with the same answer. So it doesn't matter. Okay? So in this particular program, it does not matter 
whether you evaluate the left-hand side or the right-hand side first on line eight, it will still give you the same result, okay? But the trace will still look different, okay? Whether you use the left to right or right to left order, the trace will look different even though you still end up using the same, returning the same value. So without any particular reason, I'm just gonna use the left to right convention. So in this case, I'm dealing with the first invoke, which is on the left-hand side of the addition first. It's going to be a big mess as far as writing stuff is concerned because it is a, it's a long line. So what we'll do is we are going to use this little tool to break the screen into two halves. So we can still keep track of comments and line number on one side, and then the other side we can scroll as necessary. So on line eight, we are invoking XYZ again. The first thing we do is to reallocate a column for in return info, and then we also have to allocate another one for N. Let's deal with the easy one first, okay? When you look at line eight, we are using the current N, which is three, minus one to specify the value of the new N. So column H is going to be the new N. It st starts with the value of three minus two, which, well, excuse me, three minus one, which is two. Return info has to remember, first of all, which line am I going back to and what else on that line we have to deal with. So we have to first indicate that when we are done with this invocation, we are going back to line eight. What else on line eight still needs to be evaluated? The return statement has not happened. The invocation that we are dealing with right now will provide a value which is going to change the question mark. And the second invocation is not done either. So we still have a second invoke XYZ, but this time using N minus two to specify the new value or the value of the new parameter N. So that's why the return info looks a little bit nasty. It's still kind of long like this. I can <coughs> zoom out a little bit just to see if we can fit a little bit more information. I think that's, that's a little bit better. Just because you know, we have a lot of stuff to track, that's why it looks yeah. just looks a little long okay so once we set up the two columns G and H for the new invocation now we can actually go back into the subroutine that we are invoking and start from the beginning XYZ starts on line 3 so we get back to line 3 and then we check the conditions N equals 1 is false because N actually has a value of 2 then we go to line five because this is a multi-branch conditional statement on line five it says n equals two well that is true because n does equal to two at this point so then we move on to line six which is a single return one statement when we execute return one all that is going to do is to copy and paste the return info cell change the question mark to a value of one in this case and we're done so we'll do that mechanical step copy paste, change the question mark to a value of one, and we're done, okay? And then we go continue execution of this code. There's nothing else to execute in the conditional statement itself because we just took one branch. So we're gonna go all the way to line 10, which is at the end of the subroutine. On line 10, we got two things to do. The first one is to look up the rightmost return info cell which is column G at this point. And then we say, okay, let's make a note of that so that we know where to go back to and what else to do on that line. So we just copy and paste the entire return info cell into the line column, and line number column. And then the second thing we do is to indicate that column G and H are no longer useful. Okay, so we copy and paste it and then we use strike out to indicate that these columns are no longer used. So we use strike out down here, there we go. And now we're back to line eight. Let me just move the columns a little bit here. But this time we when we get back to line eight, line eight doesn't look like before anymore. It is no longer um, having two unresolved invoke because one already has a known value to be one. So now we just have to deal with the other one which is invoke XYZ N minus two, specifying the new value of N. So just like any invoke statement, we have to allocate a column for return info cell, and we specify what to go, where, which line to go back to, and what else do we have to do when we get back to it. 
So it's going to be about the same thing. We are going to reallocate column G and H for return info and N again. Return info is going to be saying, let's go back to line 8 when this invocation is all done. We still have a return to do. But the first invocation, the, the left hand side, is already evaluated. We know that is a 1 already. The one on the right hand side is the one that we are evaluating right now. And that's why it has a placeholder of a question mark so that we have a place to specify the return value. N in this case is 1 because the current N is 3. 3 minus 2 is 1 and that's why the parameter N is 1 in this case. Do we have any questions at this point at row 15 and row 16 of the trace? It's all good? All right. All right, so without any questions, we will continue execution in the subroutine, starting on line 3. Line 3 is an easy one this time. n equals 1 is true. So we go to line 4. Line 4 has a return 1 statement, which means all we have to do is to copy and paste the return info cell, change the question mark to a 1, and there is no need to simplify 1 plus 1 is 2 at this point. This is the wrong place to evaluate 1 plus 1 because the only job of a return statement when you execute a return statement is simply to change the question mark to the value that you're returning. That's all you're gonna do. No evaluation of the addition, nothing happens at this point except for changing the question mark, okay? So there's nothing else to do on line four. After line four, we get out of the multi-branch conditional statement, so we end up at the exit point, which is on line 10. Line 10 has got two things to do as usual. The first thing is to copy and paste the return info cell so that we know where we're going back to and what else we have to do over there. And then the second thing it has to do is to deallocate everything that is allocated on a per invocation basis. So column G and H are both allocated on a per invocation basis and they're both deallocated at this point. So right now, we can then continue execution on line eight. Line eight is now just return one plus one at this point, we evaluate that 1 plus 1 is 2, so it's basically the same thing as return 2. But when you already know what value you're returning, the rest is relatively easy. You look up the rightmost return info cell, which is column E in this case. Uh, let me make sure that's column E. Yep, it is. So we just copy and paste column E, change the question mark to the value that we're returning, which in this case is 2, like that. But we are not changing x, okay? Just because we can change x, we know how to change x, we are not doing it, okay? That's not the job of a return statement. That is the job of the assignment statement when we get back to the assignment statement. We are not quite there yet, okay? So just remember, the return statement is only changing the question mark to the value that we are returning and no more than that, okay? So we are done with line eight. After line 8, there's nothing else to do in the conditional statement, so we are now on line 10. Line 10, as usual, has got the two things that it has to do. Um, copy and paste the return info cell into the, re into the line number column, and then deallocate both columns that were allocated on a per invocation basis. Okay, return info cell and the local variable n. So they're both now deallocated. Use a strike out here to indicate strike through to indicate both columns are deallocated. Now we are ready to execute line 13. Line 13 just wants to store a value of 2 into x. x is uh, column D. So column D now has a value of 2 as the result of execu executing line 13. And now line 13 is completely done. We are moving on to line 14. Line 14 is the end of the main subroutine, which means we are going to deallocate both of these columns after making note that we, have, we, are con we are continuing execution at post and then we have no use of column C or D anymore. Copy and paste it. Indicate that these are no longer allocated. Then we continue execution at post. We are all done. Yes, um, there are people who suggested the use of uh, accounting uh, yeah. exercise books, you know, general ledger, because they're wider and they're already uh, lined up. They're 
columns and rows. I since we're not typing, know. copying, and pasting. <laughs> well, okay, I can see your point though. Everything these things are being very um, tedious. <clears throat> so I have here contemplated with the idea of I give you a partial trace and give you the actual code, and you just have to continue the execution for a few more lines. So I have already I thought about that. Not quite sure whether I want to do that or not, but that's one of the options that I have. Because if the idea is to check whether you understand the concepts of calling and returning or dealing with the return statement and stuff like that, I can change it so that I can just say, okay, by the time you get here, this is what the trace looks like. Just continue at this point. All right. This one is actually not too bad. It does look kind of tedious, but they only use all the way up to column G. It's just that each one like this one is kind of long. Yeah. That's yeah. Where I was <laughs> yep. The alternative to do this is basically just to say, okay, just give me the information every time we get back to line eight. The rest of the lines, I don't care. So you don't have to like actually turn in, but you still have to track it because you know the algorithm that you'll be executing cannot be tracked by just mentally keeping track of which. Bare reload has got that. So it will still be kind of like that. Okay, any questions about this particular example, which is known as the Fibonacci number? What was the first time you heard of Fibonacci number? The Da Vinci Code is one. Go ahead. Okay. So spirals. Yep. That, I think that's also what is displayed on the website is the spiral right there. Yep. Alright. Any other questions about the Fibonacci number as an example? So most people look at these and go like, well, you know, that seems like a you know a tricky case that can only be handled by recursive subroutine calls, which is not true. Fibonacci can be handled by something else as well. Let's take a look at another algorithm. I'm not going to trace this one because this one is really quite nasty. Um, you can go through a lot of YouTube videos and flash animation to actually see it in action. It's called the Tower of the Towers of Hanoi. How many people have heard of that particular problem? The Towers of Hanoi. Okay, so let's take a look at that one because you will like it, especially people who like animations and stuff like that. Towers of Annoy. <clears throat> okay, so it looks like this. Okay, this is the actual physical, you know. Uh, it, oh, let me sh not show the animation yet. Okay, so the idea is you want to move all the disks from the left column to the right column. You can use the middle one as a temporary column. Okay, so most people go like, well, that's pretty easy. I'll just lift the entire stack out of the left one. Move it to the right hand side, drop it, we are all done. Can't do that. Okay? Okay, if I cannot do that, then I'll move, you can only move one disk at a time. Okay, that's the limitation. One of the limitations is one disk at a time. Most people look at it and say, well, that was still easy. I'll move all the disks from the left column one by one into the middle one, then it'll be reversed, <coughs> right? Because you have the small one, the big one, and the larger one, the largest one on top. And then you move the largest one from the middle one to the last one, and you're all done. Well, you cannot do that because let me tell you the second rule of this game. The disk that is below another one has to be a bigger one. You cannot have a bigger disk on top of a smaller disk. That's the other restriction. So how are you going to do this? Yep. Can I answer it? Yep, go ahead. So you take the smallest one, put it on the right, put the next biggest one in the middle. Smallest one, put it on top. Next biggest one on the right. You just keep moving it. Take the next biggest one, put it right. And you yep. Just, you're all done. So, you're absolutely correct. But you're basically looking at a larger problem by bringing it into a smaller problem yeah. that has the same nature. Okay. In other words, let's look at your know, simpler examples and see if we can solve those problems. Okay. So I'm going to use this as an example, and I'll just say that 
if we have only one disk, can we solve that problem? There's only one disk here. Can we solve that problem? Well, that's an easy one. We just copy this one over here or move it over here. We're done. Now we think about two disks, right? So we have three. You're only allowed to move it one spot too, right? Sorry? You're only allowed to move it one spot though as well, correct? Or can you move it two spots? I think you can move it directly. Okay. Yeah, you can move from any column to any column, but the two restrictions are you can only move one disk at a time and you cannot put a larger disk on top of a smaller disk. Those are the only two restrictions. So now let's say we have two disks, okay? This is the start state of the problem. How do we solve this problem? Well, yep. Okay, so the solution is to move this one over here, move the larger one all the way over here, and then we have the smaller problem of moving the smaller one on top of the last peg. Okay? What if we have three? So we start now with three problems, three pegs. Okay? Now, the big question is not to not exactly how to sequence this, but how to break the larger problem into a smaller problem of the same nature. So I can say, hey, I know how to move two disks from one peg to another peg. I know that already. So in theory, I can now treat both of these as one single stack and say, I will just repeat this process here, except I don't move it to the last one. I move both of these over here. Is that okay? Well, if both of these are over here, then the largest one is all by itself. I'll just copy over here. Oh, but what about these two over here? Because then I'll have these two over here and the large one over here. But now I have the same small problem again of only having to move two disks from one particular post to another post. I would never run into the problem of having a larger disk on top of a smaller one because the largest one is already here. So now I take these two and then repeat this process here to move them over here. So this is the key to finding a solution using recursion, is you look at a bigger problem and you think of the solution of the bigger problem as some steps on top of solving a smaller version of basically the same problem. Whenever you can use that approach, recursion works. So let's take a look at the animation, yeah, just so that we, I know some of you like animations. So in this case, we have three poles and four disks. And it's already in the process of doing it. Okay, this is the final state. So we go back to the beginning and start all over again. This is the start state. So now we have a subproblem of three. Move the largest one to the other side. Now we have a sub-problem of moving the three back to the largest one. Just like that. Okay. You can also look at the algorithm of doing this. Oh, look at this. That is nasty. <laughs> that might take a while. <laughs> <laughs> I think they, it's, 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 it's a form of punishment. <laughs> you have been uh, late for school for so many days, and the number of days determines the number of disks. So that after we, a while, it just keeps getting more and more time consuming. Each one now. Yes, it, it gets, uh, okay, let's take, let's take a look at the time complexity of this thing, which is basically saying, okay, how much time or how many steps do I need to take to solve the problem? How does that relate to the number of disks? Okay, let's take a look at that one. And they are usually pretty good with uh, indexing this sort of thing. Complexity, come on, big old notation. It doesn't have the complexity, but it's, it's, it's has got to be here, uh, right here. With 64 disks, I think, it would take 2 to the power of 64 minus 1. Let me, let me look, look for 64, which is the original problem. Control F, 64. There we go. So the, the origin of this is the French mathematician, 
I have no idea what to, how to pronounce this in French. Uh, there's a story about an Indian temple, which contains a large room where three time-worn pearls in it, surrounded by 64 golden discs. So with 64 golden discs, and you have to follow these rules, according to the recursive algorithm, it will take two to the power of 64 minus one uh, moves to do it. And it, this calculation is assuming one move takes one second. So this will take uh, 583 billion years, which is really a long time because the Earth only has been around for four billion years. <laughs> And the sun only has another two billion years to go before it expands and engulf and, and burn the earth. So, you know, so they will have to take this puzzle into some kind of um, spaceship as humanity migrates to another galaxy or something. I think that much time is enough, you know, depending on which theory you subscribe to, if you subscribe to the theory of the universe is forever expanding. Um, in that amount of time, the entire universe will be dead because you know, there won't be any energy or combustion, not combustion, but uh, fusion left to perform. So, yeah. So it is a long, it, it will take a long time to solve that problem. Is that okay? See, they, they even say right here, it is 127 times the current age of the sun. You guys don't seem to be impressed by these numbers. It's like, yeah, yeah, 127 times, whatever. <laughs> OK, so but how do they come up with this number? It's 2 to the power of 64. Because when you look at this, you start to get a sense of that idea already. To solve the problem of a three-disc problem, you need to repeat the, the two-disc problem twice. Because the first time, is to move these two disks into this post. Then it becomes a trivial operation to move the bottom disk all the way over here. And then what do you have to do? You have to repeat the solution of a two disk problem again to go from here to here. So if you think about it this way, then you can think about the most general problem, which is you have one extra disk here, and you have a pile of disk here. But you already know how to deal with a big pile of disk. So the solution to this problem is quote unquote easy because you just put the entire pile over here, right? Move the largest disk all the way over here, and then you move the entire pile back here. But that is the same thing. It is twice the amount of time of solving the problem that has one fewer disk and then plus this last operation. So you will still end up with the same equation, which is two to the power of disk, which I will call n here. And then the minus one has to do with um, the last operation is adding one more to the whole thing. Okay, are there any questions about the Tower of Hanoi problem? Okay, and there might be an algorithm here. Oh, there we go. So there's another animation here <coughs> to solve a six disk problem. I'm just looking for the actual algorithm. So there we go. This is the actual algorithm, and it's recursive. Magnetic Hanoi. In the magnetic tower of Hanoi, each disk has two distinct sides, north and south pole. <laughs> so this one is alternating. So not only can you do you have to follow no big disk on the smaller disk you know, restriction, now they have to alternate as well. Because if the disks are not alternating, they won't uh, stick to each other. <laughs> Interesting. And there's a science fiction now in hail. Doctor Who has one. I haven't seen the one that the older versions of a Doctor Who, but apparently there's one here as well. <clears throat> so anyway, uh, this is another example of a recursive solution to a problem that is that can be described. The solution can be described as the solution of a smaller problem and then a few extra steps. 
Any other questions? No other questions? So you guys are all good with recursion and subroutines, passing by parameter, passing by value, passing by reference, that sort of thing? What if I'm passing a pass by value parameter by reference to another subroutine? What's going to happen? <laughs> okay, there are four possible cases. Okay, the four possible cases is okay. Let me just kind of write the code because you know if I describe it verbally, it's just as confusing. But if I write it out as a program, it is easier. Okay. Um, A B C. Okay. By reference, x, x gets seven, and define sub, define sub, d e f. By reference, x again, um, in vogue, a b c, x specifies x, and define sub, define main, local x. X gets a value. Oh, X doesn't need a value because we can just invoke. So we invoke DEF, use X to specify X. And define sub, invoke main. Okay, now we go back to do all the indentation. Okay. And do all of these in one single stroke. This is one possible way which is passing a parameter that is already passed by reference to you and you're passing it by reference to somebody else. So the question is, mm, what does it do when we execute this code? Well, let's figure it out. This one won't take long. Uh, we don't have return info and recursion and anything nasty like that one. So this one should be pretty easy to figure out. The precondition has nothing to say because there are no global variables. Now we do have three x's here because we have one local variable x in main, one pass by reference parameter in def, and one pass by reference x in abc. So we do have three um, identifier x's here. Each one is slightly different. Okay, has di has a different meaning. We start execution on line thirteen, which is outside of the definition of a subroutine. We have a return line number of post, and we do have to allocate for local variable x of main, which, which starts with an unknown value. So far, nothing really new. This is a fairly typical template of how we do things now. We get to line 11. Now we have to set up a return line number. It's not a return info because DEF does not return a value. There's no need to use return info. You can if you want to, but you will just be saying, that when you're done, go back to line 12, and then you describe the entire line 12, which is not really necessary. It's just a lot of extra work for, not, for nothing. So on line 11, the return line number is just line 12. Okay? But we have a parameter this time. It's not a local variable. This time it is a parameter, because when you look at the definition of DEF, it has a by reference parameter x. Okay, So this is the confusing part on line 11. Okay? On line 11, we are using x to specify x. So which x are we talking about? The x on the right hand side is always the parameter. Okay? That is the new thing that we are setting up. The one on the left hand side is the one that I already know. Since line 11 is in main, and I'm currently in main, so that basically means the x on the left hand side is referring to local variable x of main, which is column C. I'm using that x to specify parameter x of DEF, which is the subroutine that I'm calling on line 11. Now, because it is passed by reference, how many people know or remember how to set up a column for a parameter that is passed by reference? It is also known as, it is an alias, in this case of what? Column C, very good. Okay, so that's good. So now we, we got these two columns set up, and now we can continue execution inside the subroutine DEF. DEF by itself doesn't do anything. It is delegating all the work to be done by ABC. So on line seven, 
it is basically just calling the other subroutine. Once again, we set up a return column, return line number, and a parameter x as well. This is the part where we have that big question, okay? The return line number is not a problem, okay? The call or the invoke is on line seven, so when we are done, we go back to line eight. That's the easy part. The confusing part is, what do we use to specify x? Because do we pass the reference to a reference? In this case, do I say is AKA also known as column C? Or do we, excuse me, okay, let, I'm, I'm trying to fix the grammar first. Okay, AKA column C, or do we, so do we specify this as AKA column C, or do we specify this as AKA column E? In other words, is it using the same reference, or is it, am I, am I supposed to refer to the reference of a reference. Reference of a reference. That is actually not the case, even though it sounds about right, but it's not. Because you could then specify later in the code another reference for it, couldn't you? Okay, think of it this way. Okay, so we have graffiti. Um, how, do, how do you call people who do graffiti? Artists. <laughs> okay, fine. We have a few artists in this class, right? So we'll say artist one and artist two, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm the I'm the original author of the book. I know the call number of my book in the library. And I say, well, since I'm only good with words, I want you guys to add pictures to it. Okay? So I so how do you add pictures to a book that is in the library? Do you use pass by value where I give you a copy of the entire book? Or do I give you a call number so you can find the book in the library? The second approach, right? So I give artist number one say, here's your call number. Uh, go ahead and you know, add the annotations and pictures to the book, okay? So you are actually subroutine the yeah. You are given a call number to the book. So you're supposed to go and annotate draw pictures and whatnot. But you have too many exams in art and media classes, and you decide, nah, I'm not gonna do it. I've gotta pass it on to somebody else. So now the question is, are you going to pass on the call number, the little slip of paper, or the same call number that I gave you to the next person, or are you going to create a new call number so that that little slip of paper with the call number has its own call number in the library? I'd rather do the first option. The first option, which means you're just gonna jot down the like, tag gave me this call number, here, go ahead and you know, go find that book and draw pictures. So that means when you are when you are given a pass by reference parameter and you pass it by reference again to somebody else, you just pass the reference itself along. You do not pass a reference to a reference. Is that okay? So I'm hoping the library you know, analogy works out in this case because a little slip of paper with a call number does not have a call number itself. Okay. Which means in this case, in column G, we simply say AKA column C. It is the, it's a reference to the same original column. Are we doing okay so far with this particular combination of passing by value versus passing by reference? Okay, but this is the behavior of all you know, known programming languages when you pass a parameter that is already passed by reference to you and you pass it by reference to somebody else, you are just passing that reference along. So you don't use a reference of a reference, okay? So now we are finally getting to line three, which is the actual subroutine that is doing some work, and it is saying, okay, let's store seven into x. Okay, first of all, which x are we talking about? Because we have three columns with the name of x, with the labeling of x. So the first one that we get to is the rightmost column with the label of x, which is column G. Column G says, well, don't store anything to me. I don't store anything, but I know the location where it is supposed to be stored. I know that column C is the one that is supposed to store the value. So from column G, which is a pass by reference parameter, you go straight based on its instruction to column C, 
and column C is the one that is storing the value of 7. After line 3, everything interesting is already done. At this time, it's just the boring stuff left. So on line 4, we say we don't need these two columns anymore. After we make a note of continuing onto line 8, so now we deallocate both of these columns and say don't need those anymore. Now we are on line, on line 8. Line 8 is also the end of a subroutine, which means we look up column D and say continue at line 12. And then we have no use of these two columns anymore. And strike those two out. And now we continue execution on line 12, which means we are at the end of the main subroutine. We have no use of these two columns anymore. But we make a note that we continue on post. And then we get rid of these two columns. And that concludes the execute. Oops, wrong thing to do. Undo. And then we strike through. There we go. OK. So this is one of the four possible terminations, by ref to by ref. So the other three would be by ref to by valve, by valve to by ref, and then by valve to by valve. Okay. This is the trickiest one. Okay. Next trickiest one is going to be. Um, I'll just change. Well, I don't know. I'll be kind and just copy and paste it and then change it. Go and we'll change this one to a by val here. So the trace is not going to be the same anymore because of that. Okay, so we'll trace this code here. And remember, the only change that I have made is to change the by ref on line six to by val. But because of that change, this double sided arrow also has to change because I don't use double sided arrow when I pass something by value. Only use double-sided arrow when I pass by reference. So I have to make two changes because of the way I use my pseudocode. In actual C and C++, you only make the change where the parameter is declared. You don't change where you pass the parameter. Okay. All right, so let's try to track down this code and see what's going to happen. We have five minutes, which is more than enough. So line number, the precondition once again has nothing to say. And then we start on line 13. Oh. OK, I heard that. <laughs> we good? OK. OK, so we have local variable x, which starts with an unknown value. And then we go to line 11, which is an invoke statement. So we allocate another return line, return line number column. And then we indicate when we get back, we'd go to line 12. So, so far, so good. No big deal. And we have a parameter in DEF, which is passed by value. It's called x. Now we have a problem. Because what am I going to pass here? Let's think about it. On line 11, the x on the left-hand side refers to the local variable x. Since this is passed by value, column E is basically a copy of column C. At this point, I'm trying to copy the value. Since I don't know what column C has, I technically don't know what value I'm actually passing to column E. So if I want to really trace the code, I have to put a question mark here because I don't know the exact value that I'm using to initialize parameter x. And then I continue on, but this is not the end of the trace, OK? So I continue on into onto line 7. Line 7 is passing this pass by value parameter by reference to ABC. Okay? So now when we set up the columns, return line number is the easy one. The return line number is 8. That's the easy part. The difficult part is, what about this x here? This is parameter x of ABC, which is supposed to be passed by reference. So I'm using x. Of, a, B, of DEF, which is a by value parameter, to pass it by reference to, call, to X of ABC, which is passed by reference. In this case, it really is an alias. But at this point, I have no way to track back to column C anymore. So I can only track back to by value X of line 6, which in the trace itself is column E. So that means column G 
is an alias of column E, not column C anymore. Okay. <coughs> so by, by the time we get into the subroutine ABC on line 3, we are storing a 7. We store a value of 7 into x. The first x that I find, the rightmost x that has a label of, the rightmost column that has a label of x is column G, which refers to column E. Column E, as a result, is the one that is now changed to 7. Okay? And then after line 3, we get to line 4. It's the end of the invocation. So we end up uh, deallocating both of these columns. Line 4 itself, oops, so we go back to line 8, sorry. Line 8 is also the end of a subroutine, so we end up the, making a note that we have to continue on to line 12, and then we have no use of these two columns anymore. So we deallocate both of these. Now we are on continue, continuing execution on line 12. If I had any code after 11, x would still be unknown because the, by the time we get to ABC, that parameter x can no longer find out where the local variable x of main is. We have lost track by that time. So if I had any code, code to make use of the value of local variable x, it would not be possible to do any calculation because local variable x, which is column C of main, has an unknown value. It never got any initialization. But since I don't have anything like that, by this time, I just have to make a note to continue execution at post. And I have no use of these two columns anymore. Strike them through. And then when we get to post, we are all done. So as I said, five minutes, we got enough time to trace this. So the only other two cases where I have not gone through that you might want to go through as an exercise is to change this by valve into a by ref change this by ref into a by valve. Okay, see what happens. And then the last one is pretty obvious, is by valve and by valve. So you might want to spend some time to try that out before Wednesday, because when you try it out first, then you will actually see what is happening. By the time I explain it, it's going to be pretty clear why you know, the program turns out to be the way it is. Are we going to be going over like the practice test yes. in class? Yep, so when we'll be that? going through the practice test on Wednesday.